I want you to believe, to believe in things you cannot. In 1897, Bram Stoker introduced the world to Dracula, the vampire, the legend, the thing that would inspire so many horror stories to come. But who inspired Dracula? Many people believe that it was Vlad the Impaler of Romania. Maybe so. But what if I told you that there was someone else, someone far more evil, sadistic, and a lot more closer to a real-life vampire than Vlad ever was? Hi, my name is Gabe Bauer, and this is Top Shelf History, where we combine great stories with great drinks. This is the Vampire Queen. It is a drink I have made for you based on the terrifying life of Elizabeth Bathory, whose own horrifying experiences borderline on the mythical. The drink is made with four ingredients. It's made with grenadine, Hungarian plum brandy, maraschino liqueur, and with vodka. Elizabeth was born on August 7th, 1560, to a family of Hungarian nobles. The Bathories were one of the most wealthy and respected families in all of Central Europe. As such, Elizabeth was surrounded by luxury. She was educated. She could speak several languages, and she knew how to conduct herself both as a lady and a noblewoman. And like most noblewomen at the time, she was married young, at the age of 14, to a young Hungarian count named Ferenc Nadazdi on May 8, 1574. And as a wedding present, Ferenc gifted his new bride with a castle, as most people do, named Shaktise, or something like that. When the war broke out between the Ottomans and the Hungarians in 1591, both allies and enemies alike were exposed to the extreme brutality and violence of Ferenc on the battlefield. Despite this incredible show of force, it actually won him a great amount of adulation in the eyes of the monarchy, as he would be dubbed the Black Knight of Hungary. But Elizabeth wasn't known for her marriage to Ferenc or his propensity towards violence. No, she's known for being a serial killer. Elizabeth was always thought to have tortured her servants. Some even speculate that Ferenc taught her how. But in 1601, a new person would come in and she would heighten the sadistic nature of Elizabeth's personality far more than ever before. And her name was Anna Davalia. A suspected witch would come to the castle Chaktice, or something like that, in 1601. From there, Elizabeth's personality would begin to change. She became more brutal, having a shorter fuse and a little bit more sadistic. Things would get a lot more tense in the castle. In 1604, Ferenc would pass away, and all of his holdings and his property would be given over to Elizabeth to control. Now, this was just another moment where her personality began to change, and not in a good way. It became even more brutal, perhaps from stress or from something else. But the townsfolk were starting to take notice of not only the fact that she was becoming a little bit more brutal, but the fact that their girls were missing. See, Elizabeth had many servants. Most of them, if not all of them, were female. And a lot of the speculation over some of her crimes comes from the fact that their girls would be sent up as maidens to the castle for service to their noblewoman, and they would never be seen from or heard from again. Hysteria would rise, so much so to the point that the townsfolk would petition to King Matthias II to finally take notice of all the things that were going on in their land. And he would dispatch a man, Georgi Thurzo, to investigate and try the case against Elizabeth Bathory. Well, what he would uncover was, in short, unbelievable. The accusations against Elizabeth Bathory are nothing short of horrifying. Some believed that she held a diary uh, consisting of 650 names of people she had killed. Another was that she would 
kill her victims, uh, mostly virgins, and then bathe in their blood in order to preserve her beauty. Others would say that she would drink the blood of her victims and, or consume their bodies for whatever reason, kind of leaning into this vampire idea. Some would even accuse her of being a vampire. Now, historians know that they've never found the diary and almost all of them have disputed the actual literal blood baths that she would soak herself in, but nonetheless, it was what would actually give her the moniker of the Blood Countess. Now, Elizabeth was tried for hundreds of murders here. She was accused of so many people disappearing and dying, and in the end, she was actually convicted of at least some of those murders, and she would be given life house arrest. So she would be confined to her house for the rest of her life. Any of the servants that had anything to do with some of these murders were also uh, condemned, and but for them, it wasn't house imprisonment, it was death by burning at the stake. Not a great end. But then again, it wasn't a great end for their victims either, just saying. But there are some historians that actually believe that there may be another thing here at play. They believe that Matthias II, the King of Hungary, was actually taking advantage of the opportunity presented by the hysteria of the townsfolk against this powerful noblewoman, and he saw that he could take her land, her holdings, her wealth, her power away from her by cashing in on this hysteria. Now, for me, I think it's kind of somewhere in between. I don't know if she's necessarily the demoness that killed people for the sadistic pleasure of it, but I'm also not entirely certain that she was just this, you know, victim of a, a opportunistic nobleman trying to steal her land. She's probably somewhere in between, but regardless, the mark Elizabeth made on history is unmistakable and very bloody. Now, with that reminder that history is definitely better with a drink, let's get into our drink. And for that, we are going to put up our glass. And for our first ingredient we're going to put in here is going to be a Hungarian plum brandy that is called Zvak Slivovitz. Um, you can see it's Hungarian and it's kosher. And this whew, is hard to drink. Um, it's not like other Slivovitzes that I've had. This one has a particularly bitter aftertaste that can stay with you for a little bit. It almost tastes medicinal. Um, and we're gonna have to work hard to make sure that we balance this all out. But I wanted a Hungarian liquor in this drink. I got a Hungarian liquor. Uh, so for that, we're gonna put in about a quarter ounce into our drink. Be very careful about it. So let me get my jig here. And we definitely don't wanna put in too much here. I, I'm, I'm not lying. This is not the easiest to drink. So about a quarter ounce, I think that's plenty. Uh, we're going to follow that up with a half ounce of Luxardo Maraschino liqueur. This is a nice cherry liqueur, very syrupy, very delicious and sweet. Um, you could find probably something like Kirsch, uh, which is German or something else, uh, another cherry liqueur that will do just fine here. We're gonna go with Luxardo. Just gonna add a nice bit of sweetness and help balance our drink with the Zvak, because the Zvak hits hard. And then we will follow that up with one ounce of Russian standard vodka. And the reason why I'm using vodka here is because with most Central to Eastern European nations, which Hungary is, uh, they kind of share a common ancestry in the Slavic peoples. I know the Hungarians are a little bit different than, say, perhaps Serbia or Russia, but they're closer to, you know, that Slavic identity that's so indicative of, you know, what those people are. And so I feel like let's use a Slavic liquor. So we're going to throw in an ounce of vodka. The other reason why I really like using this is because vodka is incredibly simple to mix with. It just adapts to everything. So that's a nice convenient factor to add in here. There we have it. And now we've got a nice, somewhat syrupy, uh, very clear drink. And I think it's time for us to add some color. After all, this is the Blood Countess, after all. The Vampire Queen is the name of our drink. So 
let's add in a little bit of some dark bloody uh, elements and for that I'm gonna throw in some homemade grenadine now this ain't your roses grenadine that you're buying at the store this is homemade uh, I made this with pomegranate juice I use palm you could also have pomegranate molasses uh, that is thrown in there as well really necessary uh, to kind of get all the flavors correct in there some sugar and then some orange blossom water it's pretty simple to make and it's so worth it it is so much better i think than any store-bought grenadine so definitely worth a try if you ever give it uh, we're going to throw in a half ounce of our homemade grenadine and just look at that beautiful color and that is gorgeous but you know i think we need to put this in a glass that's as cold as the heart of the woman who was said to have killed tens to hundreds of young girls. So let's grab our frosted glass. Oh yeah, about as cold as her heart. And before I put in our liquid here, I'm going to coat this with our own little blood mixture. Now this is the same grenadine, but it's been reduced down to a nice syrup consistency, about 15 minutes uh, on the stove on low, and then I threw in some beet juice for some color. So we're just going to toss that around the side. And doesn't that look wonderfully bloody? We're gonna add a little bit more. Come on, does that not a grab your attention or what? And we are just gonna place this here, mess up some of our frostiness and pour in our drink. And there you have it. The Vampire Queen. And I think it is about as sadistic, evil looking, and yet also delicious as I was hoping it would be. Let's give it a try. Now, of course, the frost is gonna melt pretty quickly, but still looks pretty good. Mm. That is so interesting. The grenadine tastes very good. I love the syrup. You want to be uh, a little careful with how much you put in there though because the syrup can also be a little overpowering but it's delicious it's sweet um, you definitely get a taste of the spock still it still comes through it's so powerful i it's amazing really i got to give them credit the hungarians know how to make sure that they have staying power here um, but it's still a very good drink slightly bitter on the end but uh deliciously fruity um, and ominously bloody definitely a drink fit for a vampire queen and that sounds like last call vampires right where did they come from where did the mythology kind of be born out of and according to my research i found out that vampires actually uh, kind of started from a misinterpretation of how the dead decomposed um, people, when they would bury the dead, they would um, obviously not entirely understand the decomposition process in which that not only does the skin shrink back and obviously gets eaten away and all the bodily fluids start to you know, dehydrate or uh, dry up or what have you, um, but as all of this change is happening to the corpse, the, the, the teeth would be exposed and, and the full root would be exposed. And so it looks like as if your teeth got longer and that would be the inspiration for the fangs. And then uh, the, there's a fluid that comes out of the body as well that, you know, is part of the decomposition process that looks dark and almost like a deep dark red uh, that would dry up and around the nose and around the mouth areas. And so that's kind of where we get the idea that vampires would rise from the dead, these undead creatures rising up out of the ground and then hunting and preying upon humans at night with their fangs that they could retract and then grow and then they would suck the blood out of you and uh, and they would go back into their little crypt uh, or I guess you could say their coffin and continue to rest until the next night or the next time that they need to feed. But kind of an interesting and somewhat plausible point, I suppose you could say, from uh, you know an old way of thinking. But pretty crazy to think about the 
the mythological origins of the vampire coming from just a misunderstanding of the breakdown of the body but it fueled so many other you know hysteric things as we saw in today's episode and so many others who are accused of vampires especially in eastern europe now uh, for as interesting as all that is i gotta say it doesn't make for the greatest story at times so i'm pretty happy with the modern renditions of our vampires because despite sometimes the cringiness of twilight it's still pretty entertaining and a lot of people like it Thank you all so much for watching. For more of my historically inspired cocktails, you can find them here or you can find them at my website at topshelfhistory.com. There we also have all of our blogs, recipes, deep dives, and more from all of us here at Top Shelf History. Remember, history is definitely better with a drink. Cheers. <laughs>